Yes, Sarah is wonderful. No, sir. No. Thank you. Sorry, I'm poised. You're gonna sit there. I, I, that will take me too long to figure out. That big screen is like a Frankenstein the way he's got it cut off. Every once in a while, you're a little too close. Every once in a while. Just take it. Yeah, you can take it from here. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you. No, you're not in here. <laughs> um, but don't hesitate to ask questions. No. Okay. I'm very <laughs> All right, she's yeah, we're recording. Here we go. All right. All right. Thank you, Julie. Thank you so much for uh, setting it up. And welcome to the, uh, the third week of our three week series of Bain Hamid Sarim Between the Barriers, the three week time in. Uh, in the summer that we commemorate the destruction of the first and the second temples and uh, a lot of other things that occurred at that time also, which we're really not going to be going into too much of that. Um, this is a overview and there's a lot of detail, a lot of information that is not included in this class. So I encourage everyone to read the book, Go on online, find more information. There is a lot of information available. Um, and this is this isn't here an overview. All right, last time, if you have if you have the packet on page one, we finished up through the destruction of the first base on Mikdash, the first temple, and which was in the year 3338 on the Jewish calendar or 422 BCE on the secular calendar. And now we're going to talk about between the destruction and the building of the second holy temple base Hamikdash. Okay. Have a, a map on page five in the packet, which is really a map, a current map of the Middle East. And it, I, made a, uh, an outline around Babylonia, which is today Iraq, and also the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. They're that like, I don't know, it looks like a pincher or tongs or a, a picture of a fish maybe, or the outline of a fish. But those are the Tigris and don't Euphrates rivers, <laughs> which for really, um, for really close to 2000 years, the Jews lived um, a thousand years from the time from the destruction of the really from 11 and a half years before the destruction of the first space of Mikdash through approximately the year 1000 we'll say there was a thriving Jewish community and the communities in Babylonia were the center for the for Jewish life and for Torah learning families from all over Western Europe, as well as Israel, would send their children, their sons, to study often in the schools, in the yeshivos in Babylonia. Through that 1,000 years, it was really the mainstream Jewish community in all ways. And all questions on, um, in terms of Jewish practice and ritual would, would go through letters, through carriers to the great yeshivos, the great schools in Babylonia. And, they, and those answers have actually, we've saved most of them. They've been published today. 
and you can you can study them. And that was um, an addition to the writings of the oral Torah, the Toshe Balpet. It was added to it through the years. Okay. I, I have a question. Yes. Right. Is there an extra packet over there or no? Okay. Um, I, I, I feel like... All right. So we left we left off last week that the um, the Jewish community in Babylonia, the ones who had been taken first into exile were the, from, from the Southern Kingdom, were the scholars as well as the very wealthy. And so when the rest of the Jewish community was taken out of Judea, when they, um, they came to Babylonia and there was a full community there, full with resources and schools and synagogues and it, it was already built up for them. So when they came, they weren't coming and building from scratch a new community. So that was pleasant. Additionally, the Jews in Babylonia found that the, the actual earth, since they were mostly in agri the agricultural world for their careers, the actual earth was very similar to the land of Israel, as well as the seasons and the, the climate. So that was also very comfortable for them. The third reason that helped them to adapt relatively quickly was the language Aramaic, which was the language of Babylonia at that time, had really already pretty much taken over the, the Middle East, even, even with the Greek Empire, Aramaic still remains the prime language. And so when they came, they were comfortable with the language as well. If anyone has immigrated, or has close friends or relatives who have, these are, these are the obstacles that usually finding a place to live that's comfortable, um, the language, finding a, um, a job. So these things were relatively easy in the transition going from the land of Israel. And so um, it says, our, our rabbis say that this was called the soft, it was galus, it was exile, but it was soft. And that was one of the measures of God's love for us that he showed us in giving us this very soft exile. Okay, I'm going to quickly go through the years of exile till we rebuild because I really, since we're coming to Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, this week, I want to really focus on the reasons for the destruction of the second temple. So here we go, put on your seatbelts. Okay. <laughs> Before we left the land of Israel, before the exile, there was a prophecy that foretold that we would be in exile for 70 years. And after 70 years, we'd be enabled to return to the land of Israel and begin to rebuild the Holy Temple. The question was, when do we begin to count those 70 years? From the first exile, from the second exile, from the time they left? till they came to Babylonia, when they came into Babylonia, from the day of the destruction and the fire of the, um, of the Beis HaMikdash, the Holy Temple. So it's, it was really very questionable. And not only the Jewish communities knew of the 70 year prophecy, but also the kings of the surrounding lands knew of the prophecy. So they're also aware of it and everyone's counting and trying to figure out when will be the end of those 70 years. The kings of the neighboring countries are thinking that if it, there's 70 years and there is no return to the land of Israel, then God has abandoned his people. And then they could take us over, do whatever they want to us. Until then, there's a little bit of a respect for us and letting us live more dignified lives, even when we're in exile. All right. 
what we're going to say approximately 50, 52 years into the exile, so we don't know the exact count, at approximately somewhere around the 50 year mark, the Persian Empire grows. And just like the Romans swallowed the Greek Empire, the Persian Empire is going to swallow the Babylonian Empire. Right, later on, the Roman Empire swallows the Greeks. We're not there yet. Um, at this point, the, um, the king, who there's a king for one year, then another king comes, his name is Koresh, he's a, or Cyrus, if you look on in the secular history timelines, he seizes the throne. He has this healthy respect for the Jewish people, and he gives them permission if they want to return to Israel and re rebuild the temple. And remember, there is a small but um, poor community still living in the land of Israel. We've never really... We never really left completely. Okay. So over 42,000 people returned and they began to build to build the, um, the Holy Temple, the base of Mikdash. And to make it very brief, they are building it. And as they're building it, they're singing and they're fill, filled with joy. Some of the neighbors, some of them wanted to help. Some of them wanted to cause trouble. And they try and um, and stop the building in any way they can, and they write a letter to the king, telling him various reasons why the Jewish people should not be allowed to build the temple. And really, the king hesitates, but because they're the community there is fresh, they're also transitioning and integrating back. And the people around them, the non-Jewish people around them are intimidating them. Somehow the building of the second holy temple, it stops, it stops. And some said it was because the king said, and it's, it's not exactly clarified until much later. So it stops, the people are there. And as they were there, they actually, many of them began to assimilate and intermarry um, because there were a lot of non-Jews living there when they came back. There were people living just like after the Holocaust, if you came back to your house, there was someone else living there. So the same thing happened here. There were other, the neighborhoods were inhabited by other people, some who had been living in, in the land and some who had been moved by some Kairav, the the one who exiled them uh, at one point. Um, so there were other there were other people living into the moving there, and so when they returned and tried to live in their homes, they some did, some didn't. They there was a lot of um, be, going on between the two communities, and at some point, some of them did begin to assimilate into the overall community, and it's it remained status quo quo for a while. During this period of time, is the Purim story. Form story happens somewhere mid midway. It's on the timeline. You can check it. Oh yes, Purim miracle is three four o five on the Jewish cal calendar and three fifty two B C E on the secular calendar. Okay, so this happens in the middle. This story, um, which we're not going to go into today, but. Purim story begins to change things. For one thing, the Jews living in Persia are, are now very highly respected and it's out in the open, the respect. Some of the more prominent Jews, including the queen, Queen Esther, as well as Mordechai, who was her uncle, um, were, were living and had prominent positions as the King Ahasuerus' advisor. Esther, the queen, has a son with Ahasuerus, the Persian king. That son, as he grows once again, and if you look at the commentaries in these sections, it's very interesting. It's not in the text, but many of the commentaries, they surmise that Esther was coaching her son. 
And therefore, this creates a window where returning to the land of Israel, to Eretz Israel, and beginning to rebuild the temple will be possible. And so the name is Daryovash of the king, who's the son of Esther. It's actually Dar Daryovash II, the Persian king. His name is a Persian name. And the, he gives permission for the Jews to come back. They're led by uh, two prophets, Ezra and Nehemiah. They come back to build as they begin to build. Once again, the surrounding people are questioning it. And they send letters and they said, if you allow the Jews to build their holy temple, just like they revolted against the Assyrians when they had their first temple, if you allow to, them to rebuild, rebuild their holy temple, they're going to revolt once again. And you're going to see that they're going to take power and you're going to be losing on many fronts, including taxes. Taxes is a very important thing to in the ancient world uh, today also to a government taxes are important and so they wrote this letter and but and here's where we see that Daryovash was king that Daryovash was probably coached by his mother queen esther he says well let's find the original letter that said they can't build the second temple and they go through and they had to go to his summer home, his winter home, his, his palace, his capital, going through all the ar archives. And finally, they do find it in one of those, I think it was the summer palace. They found the documents and the letters. And there was really never a letter written to said to actually stop the building. So he gives them their blessing. And actually, this is when Ezra um, begins, Nehemiah was already in Israel. Ezra takes a, a group now and he asks permission because he's an advisor to the king. He asks permission to go. The king gives him permission, but is going to want him to return because he's a very valued advisor. So he has permission. He goes, he's, he starts the journey. He sees he doesn't have enough Levim and Kohanim with him. So he sends people back to convince more people to come and the second group comes they waited for them on the way and they come and they and they return to Israel when they when they return um, they see the the state of assimilation that the the beginning of the building of the of Yerushalayim and the walls and the temple that had begun really by now has deteriorated and there are breaches and he has them to um to repair the breaches. He also on Rosh Hashanah gives a, gives a very fiery, what we would call today a sermon, I guess, um, to the people about having non-Jewish wives, that that's not okay. They're either your wives and families are, need, are going to need to convert or they need to live outside of the city walls. And so we proceed, and from this point, they begin to build the, the second temple. All right. It is built. 200 years later, we're going to have the beginnings of the conquest by Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire. And that's going to lead to what is the Hanukkah story, which is going to be about halfway during the time of the existence of the second Beis HaMikdash, the Kohen Gadol of that time, during the time of the, the Greeks, and the Greeks were, were pushing their culture and their, and their religions upon us. Um, Matisyahu, who I think it's Matathias in English, and his five sons, they re lead a rebellion, the small against the many, and they over throw the Greek um, rulers. And from that point on, they take over the rulership of the, of Judea, of the Jewish kingdom, we'll call it. And they are, that is the family of the Hashmonaya. Um, they took both the, the balance of power in, in the land of Israel, the way it was set up is that there's the king, there's the Sanhedrin, 
and there's a Kohen Gadol, similar to the balance of power we have in America between the Congress and, and, and the president and the, and the Supreme Court, the different, the different bodies. So here also, and one family, um, one lineage is supposed to take one and only one of those powers. And at this point, the Hashemanayim, who were the Kohanim, so they, they took the position of Kohen Gadol, as well as becoming the kings. And that's, that's something that they were supposed to do. And that's eventually going to lead to, to their downfall. But for the moment, they had created great Jewish pride and pride in being Jewish, pride in returning to the practices of the Torah, pride in taking away from assimilation, because once again, under the Greeks, there was great assimilation and pride in your land, uh, what we would call today nationalism. Shortly after that is where I mentioned before, the Roman Empire swallows up the Greek Empire, okay? Somewhere during this time, there was a king who had come from one of the neighboring countries, not a king, I'm sorry, there was a man. He came as a slave, actually. He was working as a Jewish slave and he rebelled and he had his gang of, uh, we can call them terrorists perhaps, and he slowly but surely overthrows the dynasty of the Hashmonayim, and he crowns himself as king. You may have heard of King Herod. What King Herod is most known for in Hebrew, his name is Hordus. What he's most known for is his building. He actually rebuilt the second temple. If you have the picture, <clears throat> which we looked at last time, that is on page three. It is actually the, the picture that we always look at and that we always feel such pride was actually built by Herod. He really did a tear down. Did he tear down every single bit? We don't know exactly how much, but he rebuilt the temple and did it in a very magnificent way. And I always find it so fascinating that the, um, and my students, when I teach this very often, they say, wait a minute, can't be. Because they've always been looking at this picture and often I've taught in high school for over 50 years and often my students were in denial that it can't be. And then I challenged them to, to Google it, to go online, to talk to their fathers, to look in history books. I bring them proof. And then finally, it took them time to, to accept it so that it was actually that the second temple, um, the final version that we all look at was built by Herod. Herod, much of what he did in rebuilding the temple was because he killed many of the Jewish scholars. He did a, a massive massacre and later on he regretted it. And so as his um, form of recompensation, I guess, to the Jewish people, he rebuilt. He also built Mitzada, which many of you have probably gone to and you may have visited some of his. He also had a summer palace and a winter palace in the land of Israel. Perhaps you've visited them. There's uh, every time I go, there is more uncovered by archaeology to see. And, and he really was a, um, for the ancient world, the most impressive builder. Um, I'm especially interested because my father is a structural engineer and an architect. And so I've grown up with this. And I actually, once I traveled together with my parents and my father would explain to me many of the ways things were built. And even sometimes the tour guide would say one thing, my father would say something else. And he was determined after the tour, my father went to the Technion in Haifa and checked it out with them because they have reinforced many of the ancient places. I'll give an example. We were on the Southern side of the ex excavations by the, by the Kotel, by the Western Wall. And we were standing close. I think there was a stairway to go down and many, and many of the people in our tour began to go down the stairways. And my father said, don't anyone go down the stairs and don't go close to the to the wall. 
because he's looking at the stones and they did not look solidly on top to him. And so a lot of people laughed at him. They said, come on, it's the base on Mikdash. It's last, it's standing over 2000 years. Of course it's okay. After the tour, my father, not to be undone, he went to the Technion and he sat down with them and he asked them to show him what they've done there. And sure enough, you can't see it, but behind in the corner and going against the, uh, along the stones in the back, they reinforced it. And they said for this same, for all of the reasons my father said, there has been erosion, there have been cracks through the years and everything in the back has been reinforced so that it's safe for us today to stand as close as we want to on, on that Southern wall. So um, I actually experienced that myself and it was, it was very interesting for me. Okay. From this point in time, um, Hordes became king. He was actually appointed by Rome because Rome had taken over and they were looking for someone strong who would tend to side with them to rule the land. And Hordes, as I said, was a, was a cruel ruler and killed almost all of the scholars. Um, and that really takes care of a lot of the situation until about a hundred years before the destruction of the second temple. And that's where I want to begin today. And that's what I'd like to spend the rest of my time. Okay. First, we're going to talk about the situation. We're going to start with the years from 76 to 66 BCE. So that's before the common era. During these 10 years, the last of the Hashmonayim rulers are, so we're overlapping from, from the Hashmonayim. Um, the Kinyanai is the king. He dies fairly long, fairly young. His wife, Queen Shlomis Alexandra, she takes over the throne and she is queen. Her brother, who is one of the great rabbis of that time, is Rabbi Shimon ben Shatach. Together with her brother and with his guidance, she rules the kingdom. And for 10 years, that entire region of Judea was able to create a safe religious and political environment where people lived in harmony. She was also successful in raising a strong army to defend the land, but because it was, um, because there was such a, a safe environment and peaceful times, we were not attacked by any or even threatened by any of our neighbors, either within or outside of the land of Judea. Her brother, Shimon Ben Chetach, it's very, just very interesting what he did during this time, besides advising his sister, he built a system of schools comparable to the rise of the day school system today in, in I'm going to say North America, but really also in the world. He builds a network of schools so that every child, no matter what their social standing, standing is, their economics, whether they're orphans or not, every child was enabled to go to school and to study Torah, which of course strengthened everybody because we're all on the same page in terms of learning Torah and, um, and, and that, that perspective. During years also, the land was blessed and there was, um, you know, there was, it was a wonderful growing season. The rains came on time and the economy prospered. All right, all good times much must end. Towards the end of the 10 year reign of Queen Shlomis, she sees she's getting on in years. She knows that it's a matter of time before her reign is going to end. And she's troubled by, by the next step. She has two sons. The older son, Hyrcanus, notice the Greek names, by the way, he was a quiet man by nature. The younger son, Aristobulus, was outgoing, ambitious, and greedy. The queen's in a dilemma. 
neither son was satisfactory to be her successor and she doesn't know what to do. And she's, um, she's debating and the rabbis really aren't able to help her. And the rabbis also could foresee that this is going to cause a commotion that will end these 10 years possibly of peace. And they, they really are a total loss on how they handle it. On the queen's death, the populace of Judea is divided between the two sons, who, which one should be the successor to, um, to their mother and become the new king. The rabbinical le leadership, as I said, they, they withdrew. They're not going to give any opinions on this. That was a group decision that they made. And so what happened was in the streets, bloody riot, riots broke out between, between the two sides, those wanting one brother, those wanting the other brother to be the king. The two brothers, they thought, want to spare our people from, from more tragedy that's begun to open up. They decided together that they're going to go to the Roman general of the area, his name being Pompey, and they're going to ask him to be the mediator. Well, if the general Pompey is going to decide who is king, he of course understood this at not being helpful to the Jewish community, but has his opening to advance him as a general that perhaps he can climb higher in the political world and he can bring in Judea as a province of the Roman Empire. That was his opening. And of course he was correct. And this does become beginnings of the Roman uh, overthrow of, of the Jewish kingdom. Okay. He of course decides on um, the older, quieter brother because he felt he will make him into a puppet, will serve him and his purposes. The Jews, though, who were loyal to Aristopolis, the younger brother, they refused to accept Pompey's decision. And so once again, rioting, which led to serious fighting, broke out in Jerusalem. And this is... Uh, this is now 63 BCE. Pompey's troops, now they have an excuse to enter Judea, enter Jerusalem with troops to put down the revolt and um, to establish their rulership. And so he does. He puts, he puts Hyrcanus as his puppet king and high priest because he's part of the Hashmonaya. Um, and Aristopolis, he takes as a prisoner and all of the revolutionaries who had backed him were executed. So the brothers, as well as the, the, the Jews of Judea had really inadvertently given over Judea to Roman hands, okay. This is the beginning of a 100 year relationship with Rome that was never to our benefit and was continually resented by the Jewish community from the moment Rome came in. Judea was now heavily taxed by Rome and placed under the jurisdiction of the Roman proconsul of Syria and Judea. The Hashmonaim kings have now ended, they are gone. The, um, a Roman governor is reappointed, someone who is strong and a military leader and ruthless. These governors, one after the other, they often would confiscate land and the belongings of the wealthy Jews, and they would live in very luxurious lifestyles for themselves. For the most part, the Jews endured the hard hardships and made the best of it. 
but the Roman Empire, they were always taking further steps. So to make sure that there isn't another rebellion, one of the things they did was they divided Judea into five states so that they felt that if each one is, instead of having one kingdom, we have five different ones, each one will be smaller, each one will be weaker, each one can be broken down and assimilated quicker. The, um, officially, the, Rome, the Roman Empire, from the emperor down through the governor, governor, they disbanded the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin continued to meet. And from this point, the Sanhedrin is meeting in secret places. And they're constantly on the move. Um, in, into and they they end up in the in the Gal Galil and Golan um, are, are some of the and um, final stops of the of the Sanhedrin and they're constantly on the move constantly meeting in secret. The other thing they do is they bring more foreigners into the land because they're hoping that they can create a majority population of non-Jews. So now a lot of, besides the neighbors, we have Europeans who are now entering the land of Israel and making their homes there. This is the situation for approximately a hundred years before the beginnings of the activities that lead to the destruction of the second temple. All right, we're not going to skip over that 100 years. And um, we're going to talk about the situation as it is. So we have these five provinces. So some of them starting the ones on the coast, because when Europeans came, they tend to settle along the Mediterranean. So it starts there and then begins to move in. They would um, suffer. The Jews would suffer from constant taunts, taunts from the um, from the the foreigners who are living in the land, and they begin to become victims of murder and of robbery. The Roman government, governor at this time, we're now at 66 CE, so we, we're in the common era now, Florius, the Roman government, he, any Jew who came and protested to the Romans that someone in his family was murdered or their house was robbed or they were robbed on the road, they would put that Jew into prison for his protest. So there was no, there was no, no way of bringing justice to the people who were, who were coming against them. And this is slowly moving across the land. He was hoping Glorious is hoping that there will be a revolt, a riot from the Jews, and that would give him an excuse to create a massacre and mass looting of especially the wealthy Jews. Um, but to his dismay, and that's how we know 66 CE, Jewish community actually or, or organized a massive march to his residence seeking peace. It reminds me, you know, when I when I study this, I see the big sign with the peace sign, you know, in America and the and the peace marches. And I kind of envision that, you know, that this, and of course many of those peace marches were also led by 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 Jews. And I, I imagine that they're coming to the Roman governor because they see no other recourse and asking him massively to to let's sit down and work out a peaceful plan so that we can coexist together living in the land. The Roman soldiers, even before it gets to the governor, the Roman soldiers seeing this massive amount of people marching peacefully to the governor's residence, they are lusting for blood and for Jewish blood. And so they actually charged into the crowd of the marchers, killing many of them. Glorious feared repercussions from the emperor. He's not quite sure how to handle this. And so he retreats to his um, summer home in Caesarea. And this is the beginning. This incident is the beginning of the first revolt against the Roman Empire. Okay. 
Back on the home front, let's go to Yerushalayim, the center of Judea, the center of our country. And let's see what is happening with the Jewish community. The community living in Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem, is in constant internal religious and political rivalries. There's this ungrounded hatred among the Jews and a lack of trust and not a lack of ability to listen to each other or to work with each other. And here are the, the groups that existed. And there's so many parallels of these groups. If you look down through history and even today, if we look at you know our Jewish communities, we see so many parallels. And this is the first time that we actually see this, but it seems to have follow us through our exile. And as I'll just put in a plug now, as we walk towards the ninth of Av, and when we talk about, you know, senseless hatred of each other, I feel that this is part of what we need to overcome if we want to end our exile. And so let's go through the, the various groups. First one called the Perukshim. Those are the mainstream Jews of that time led by the Sanhedrin and our rabbis. They did not enjoy the, the Roman rule, but they feared that the, uh, destru of the destruction that a revolt and a war would bring. And they wanted, they, what they wanted was to work out a way to live with the Romans in peace, to, to be subservient to them for the moment, to keep the Jewish life going, and certainly to keep the Beis HaMikdash in existence. Second group called the Tzedokim, they actually began during the time of the Greek rule. They at that time wanted to live like the Greeks. They became our assimilated community. And now, now that the Romans had swallowed the Greeks, so they flipped into Romans, they dressed like Romans, they had Greek or Roman names. And they also, they wanted peace with the Romans. They wanted to go with the Roman government. They said, why are you, you know, following that old fashioned Torah law? Let's go with the times. The Romans are the modern ones. They're the ones that we should go to. They wanted peace at all costs with the Romans, even at the cost of the Torah. And of course, that's where the Tzedokim, the rabbis in Sanhedrin, drew, their, drew the line. We cannot sacrifice the Torah and living a Jewish life for peace, but we can do a lot up to there. All right, the third group is a group that actually attended to be the younger generation breaking off from the rabbis that they said, the rabbis and the Sanhedrin, they're too, they're too accepting of status quo. That's the older generation that, you know, that they're, they're settled and they want to just live how things are and not, and not make waves. And they were determined to fight Rome and to chase the Romans out of their land. They, they thought just like by the Hanukkah story, the small against the many, we also, the small against the many, we can stand up and we can overthrow the Roman empire. That was their position. They wanted to reestablish Jewish independence at any cost. Rakoff group from the Kanayim, they're called the Sikari. The word Sikari is a, I think a Greek word, it's either Greek or Aramaic. Remember the moment, but it, the, the word Sikari means small daggers. And they would carry small daggers under their cloaks. They broke off from the Kanayim and they were even more violent than the Kanayim. They wanted, they were against Roman rule and they also were against anyone who favored Roman rule. So they would use those daggers, unfortunately, against Romans and Jews, um, Jewish leaders who came out against the Romans. And they, uh, they quietly 
conducted their murders. They would, you know, take out their daggers in unexpected places, commit a murder, and then and then flee. Mm. All right. There's a there's one incident. There are many. So th those are those are the four groups, and we can see that the internal struggles of all of these groups is leading us that we can't get together on a position against the against or for the Romans and how to deal with them. So we're always at a standstill. And the Romans, meantime, anytime they are looking for an opportunity to take a great, a bigger foothold on Judea, and especially their goal is the Holy Temple, Jerusalem and the temple eventually. So this is this is what is happening and slowly, 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 really every time we stood up to the Romans fearlessly and did well against them, but then because of our internal strife, the Romans would find a breach and they would be able to clamp down on us a little more. And that, and that is really what, what happens for several years until finally um, they just are able to take it over slowly, slowly, slowly. That's the, the, simple, the simple explanation. There's a lot of great, great detail and a lot of very painful detail involved. There's one, one incident, one story that is most often told to express some of the, um, of what happened. And this is what I know a true story. It's quoted, I believe in the Gemara. Um, and this is an example of the downward spiral in the relationships between the Jews and also the, the corruption and the lack of morals that began to take over to the, uh, in the Jewish community. All right. There was a Jewish man living in Jerusalem, a wealthy man, and he had a friend whose name was Kamsa. And he had an enemy whose name was Bar Kamsa. One day, this Jewish man was making a party and he sent out his servant to deliver invitations. The servant, seeing Kamsa, he knows Bar Kamsa, he delivers Kamsa's invitation to Bar Kamsa. Bar Kamsa receives the invitation. He sees it's coming from his enemy. He sees, oh my, he must have forgiven me. I'm going to go to his party. I'm going to have a wonderful time. And the animosity between us is over. This is what I see. He was thrilled. He put on his best suit and he prepared to go to the party. Comes to the party. The Jewish man sees his sworn enemy at his party mingling with his guests, he's eating, he's drinking, he's laughing, and this fury builds within him. He comes over to Bar Kamsa and he asks him to leave in front of his guests. Bar Kamsa's feeling embarrassed, he says very quietly to the Jewish man, please, Anything I either drink, I'll pay for. Don't embarrass me. And he says, how dare you? What a chutzpah to come to my party and to eat and drink. He said, I need you to leave. And I want you to leave immediately. You're my enemy. And this is starting to cause a scene. People are starting to be attentive to what's happening. And Barkamsa replies, please I'll pay for half of the party. I'll reimburse you. Just don't embarrass me. The Jewish man again refuses. And then Barcamsa says, I'll pay for the entire party. Please don't embarrass me. So he refuses. And he has his servants throw Barcamsa out on the street. Barcamsa stands up, brushes himself off from the dust and his suit, and he 
screams, he screams that the Jews of Yerushalayim will pay for this deed. Many rabbis, many leaders of the community were present at this party. And yet they were silent bystanders to what happened. So not only is he not going to forgive the man who threw the party, but the entire community in his judgment were at fault and even the rabbis were at fault. And so he travels to Rome. He goes to Emperor Nero and he informs him that the Jews of Israel are planning a rebellion against the rulership of Rome and the empire. The emperor says to him, how do I know you're telling the truth? How would I know? You're a Jew. And so Arkamsa tells him, I want you to send an offering, an animal to the base of Mikdash and see if it's in the past when you've sent your offering, see if it will be accepted. Nero chose a beautiful, perfect calf and sent it back with Arkamsa. During the journey, Arkamsa makes a blemish in a very small place that would disqualify the calf to be a sacrifice. The rabbis, they were inclined to overlook the blemish because they didn't want to offend the Roman emperor. There was one rabbi who was one of the head rabbis and he objected. He said, no, can't accept it. It's not a perfect animal. It was suggested perhaps that we put Barkhansa to death because they suspected perhaps he was at fault because in the past, the emperor always sent the perfect animal and he knew the rules of the sacrifices of the korbanos. But the other rabbis said, no, we don't, we don't really know for sure. We can't, can't put him to death, we can't do that. So he goes back, comes and goes back and reports to, and he has witnesses with him and reports to the emperor that the sacrifice was not accepted. The Romans understood that the Jews were planting, planning a revolt. From this point, there is nonstop, um, and within the within the the Roman taking of the um, of the Jerusalem and the the city, and within the walls and the Holy Temple. Um, within that, there's constant in, internal strife between the parties that we mentioned before, between the Jews living within. And so that allows the Romans to, to continually um, work on it. And finally, the, the walls are breached. And on the 9th of Av, the temple is set, by, set on fire. And um, that is the destruction of the second temple. So here we are, it's a few days until the 9th of Av, and we've, we've now covered the background information so we can perhaps have an overview and more of an appreciation of what the situation was, what our holy temple was, what, what um, our history is about. I'd like to end with a story that brings the past to 20th century. A story I heard several years ago from Rabbi Dishon. It's a story about Rabbi Kahaneman, who was a survivor of the Holocaust. And he was brought to the land of Israel. And when he came to the land of Israel, he had a dream. And he, he was brought, he was a survivor, was brought out during the war. And at one point, the German armies were stationed in Egypt and they were planning to march 
on the land of Israel, which was called Palestine at that time, which by the way, Palestine was the name given by the Romans after they destroyed the second temple. And it was really for 2000 years, the Lord was Palestine. And before the state of Israel was declared, the Jews living there were called Palestinians. Now that has changed, call it another group of Palestinians, but at that time, so at that time, the, it was, it was the German army plan to march and to conquer Palestine. And so therefore many of the Arabs, the Muslims living and owning land in Israel, they were trying to sell it because they felt once the Germans come in that they're just going to take it. So if they could sell it for whatever they could sell it for, they will. Rabbi Kahneman had just come. He was an older man. And he had a dream. He had a dream to rebuild a city and create a city, a Torah city, a, a, a city that existed in ancient times and to make it into a Jewish Torah city. The name of the city is B'nai Brak. The city was owned by Arabs. He pushed and pulled everyone he knew to raise money to buy the city of B'nai Brak from the Muslim community living there. From the, there was I think two tribes living there at the time. And he pushed and pulled. And as he did, and he, he said, we are going to create a new Torah city. The people said, you know what? From the Holocaust coming out in the middle of the Holocaust like this, maybe he's not all there. He's dreaming something that, come on. Hitler's going to destroy us, all of us. And he's about to march on the land of Israel. What is he dreaming? Nevertheless, he, he pursued his dream and he did, he bought. He bought the city and the war ended. The Germans turned around and did not, did not attack Palestine. The war ended and then his dream became to build a world-class modern yeshiva, a school for really all levels of learning Torah um, that would be like the, the crown of the world. This was his dream. And in doing so, by this time from the Holocaust, he actually had connections all over the world. And he would travel all over the world to do fundraising, to raise money to build his school. He was on his way to Florida and he had a, um, a, a stopover on, a, on an evening flight in Rome, Italy. And he had, he had men, he had some men who traveled with him. He's a little older and they, they were taking care of him. And when they landed at the airport, he had, it was an evening flight and the, um, the flight to Florida was not to Miami, it was not until the morning. And so he told the, the men that were flying with him, who were taking care of him, he said, we need to leave the airport and get a taxi immediately. And they thought, okay, you know, by this time, we know he's a dreamer, Rabbi Kahanaman. What business does he have in Rome, of all places? And he said, okay, they leave the airport, they, hire, they hail a taxi, and... Rabbi Kahneman tells them, and if you want to look on page six, to travel to the Arch of Titus in Rome. And on the picture, I have two pieces. The top is a picture of the Romans carrying out the many uh, items that were taken from the Holy Temple, from the Beis HaMikdash when it was destroyed. And the bottom is an arch that you can go to today, it's still there, that is called Arch de Triomphe. And it was created because the Roman Empire has conquered Judea and the Jews will be no more. It's just a matter of a little, little more time. And so Rav Kahneman, I think I need to stand up to demonstrate this. Rav Kahneman, at this moment, they go to the arch and he stands, this old man with a long beard, 
he stands under the arch and he makes a fist and he says, Tinus, that's the emperor who destroyed the holy temple, the second base of Mikdash. Tinus, where are you? Where are your descendants? Where are your people? Where is your nation? They're gone to the dust heaps of history. Where are the Jews? We are living, we are thriving, and I am building now to create in a Jewish city a world-class school, a yeshiva dedicated to learning the Torah, the very Torah that you and the Persians and the Greeks and the Assyrians that all of you sought to destroy. That is my mission and we live today. A friend of mine told me, a friend of mine who has a cousin who lives in Rome, told me that a group of boys once climbed the arch and at the top of the arch, they carved into it, Am Yisrael Chai, the Jewish nation lives forever. And that's who we are. So our job as we come to Tisha B'Av is to be more tolerant, to be more accepting, to be more loving to each other and to everyone in this world and to, through our loving actions, to one day bring about the end of this very long journey, this painful exile, and that we should all be privileged to return to the land of Israel and to rebuild our Beis HaMikdash, our holy temple. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. Thank you to, to the L'Chaim Center. Thank you to Julie. Thank you for all of the students who have joined me for these three weeks. I really enjoyed our journey and getting to know you. Thank you so much. I wish you were. Okay. How do we? <laughs> so, Daraba, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. So much. Oh. Well, at the end, there was two. But before that, there was some more. And some of the students who were in the beginning, I've actually been corresponding with instead of a. You know, I sent out a survey in the beginning, and some of them.